I uh, welcome you to uh, this week's uh, recording, lecture, talk, whatever you want to call it. If some have been having difficulty accessing parts of the textbook, including the glossary and the appendixes, so I'm going to show you quickly uh, how to do that. First of all, you navigate to your Blackboard page. Uh, go over here to uh, Philosophy. I'm just going to use one, Section 100. Go to Course Content. And here is the textbook. That brings up your Cengage connector connecting you to the textbook. Right here is the entire textbook. Well, not quite the entire textbook. It's the individual chapters and the activities that are connected to the chapter. But over here on the right side of your screen are the new notations for getting to different parts of the whole textbook. So here is the glossary part. Um, here's the full book. If you'll go to the glossary section here, it pulls up the glossary section. So I just wanted to show you that because uh, that's changed in the last week or so. It's uh, now a little bit more intuitive about how to get there, although it, it, it did change and some people were having some trouble. Remember that I wanted you to look at the appendixes and to pay attention to the glossary terms as we'll see in a minute, the glossary terms are also highlighted in the chapters. So for today, by today I ask you to read what is ethics. So we're going to go over here on this side and we're going to click on what is ethics. And that brings you into some true and false quizzes, questions, thinking subjects over here Unless I tell you to, you don't have to do that. Although, you can go in here and self-score to give you some idea about how you're doing. So, for our purposes today, we're simply going to go over the chapter. So, we click on what is ethics, and that brings up the first chapter. If you'll look down, you'll come to the different section heads of the chapter. This is the way you get through the pages. Um, whenever you see these highlighted terms here, you can click in those and get the definitions. So, Anytime you see these colored links, you can assume, unless I tell you otherwise, that that is something that you should know. Going on down, we find applied ethics. That's certainly something you should know. Descriptive morality, we're going to talk about that in the lab sessions. I'll go over this in more detail then. I, I disagree with Poyman a bit here in descriptive ethics. Some of um, descriptive ethics are, I don't think, philosophy. They're more like sociology, and philosophy doesn't concern itself with sociological questions. 
as sociology ought not to consider ethical questions. That's not the purview of sociology, and describing the way people act is not the purview of philosophy. So let's go into the uh, other normative subjects here that sometimes get confused with philosophy. The first is religion, and religion has a special relationship to philosophy, I would say, because oftentimes the concepts that philosophy analyzes are holdovers from religion. For instance, the um, rules of how one conducts oneself in, in Judaism uh, is, is normally uh, controlled by the Ten Commandments. Again, we'll talk about that in the labs. But the Ten Commandments are not really commands so much in Judaism as they are um, rules for an orderly life or a life that has meaning or a life that is lived at peace. Much of philosophy kind of takes this idea over, I think, and it's not necessarily uh, Western religions. Uh, Buddhism has the Eightfold Path, which is similar in many regards to um, the Ten Commandments. So it's kind of cross-cultural, I would say. The next thing that often gets confused with philosophy is law. And law describes the legal constraints, not necessarily the moral constraints. There's a, one of the best examples uh, of this is St. Thomas Aquinas' idea that the immoral law is a fake law. It need not be obeyed. Uh, Dr. King, in his letter from Birmingham Jail, or, uh, from, uh, written to the clergyman in Alabama, clergyman everywhere, really, I guess, uh, suggests that treating people inhumanely, a law that upholds that, is not a law, and we are not bound by the law. So as you read that, keep that distinction in mind that moral theory is above the law. The law sometimes codifies, uh, puts into uh, imperative form uh, an analytic uh, statement from philosophy, but it is simply instructional. It's uh, the law specifies what is going to happen to you if you don't do that in that particular culture. So laws are cultural. The next thing is also cultural. If you look at etiquette, and I think I've told you this before, when I was uh, a mere lad attending elementary school, uh, the principal stood at the door of the school each morning, and if you Cross the threshold with your ball cap on, he would um, slap the ball cap off the back of your head, tell you to pick it up, and uh, you didn't wear a cap in his school. That was a law. He thought it was uh, moral, but the fact that I wore a ball cap or did not wear a ball cap did not make me a good human being from the standpoint of philosophy. So let's go to the traits of moral principles, and this is uh, far more 
important, and we're going to keep returning to this over and over again. And this is one thing that Poyman does better than anyone else, is describing the five things that a moral theory must do if it is an adequate moral theory. This makes morality, makes philosophy an entirely different process than religion or etiquette or sociology or mere descriptive um, techniques. So this is extremely important. Please pay a lot of attention to this little section here, 1.3. What is it that makes an adequate moral theory, or he says the traits of moral principles? Now, domains of ethical assessment don't get, don't get all carried away with the terminology here. As a matter of fact, I've told you so many times that part of learning philosophy is learning the lingo, I guess you might say. And this is just part of the lingo of philosophy. These are the types of ethical theories that one is going to discover in the history of philosophy. Action, consequences, consequences here um, is consequentialism or utilitarianism. Uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, character, traits, and motives have to do with deontology and Immanuel Kant. Um, read this, uh, absorb it, and then he's going to go into in-depth discussions of actions and what kind of acts are right. An obligatory act is one that requires you to do it. There's very little difference between an obligatory act and a law, except the obligatory act is universalizable, as we discovered in the section on the traits of moral principles, and laws are more local. An optional act is one that you don't have to do. It's not your duty to do it. And then we get down to supererogatory acts, um, this uh, supererogatory act is like falling on a hand grenade when it gets thrown into the foxhole where you and several other people are located to save the lives of many. Uh, supererogatory acts are acts of heroes and heroines. Uh, nobody in their right mind would require that. It is self-giving. Uh, those typically are the highest level acts. So think of that as you go through this. Consequentialism, again, is how John Stuart Mill, the greatest good for the greatest number, is the utilitarian principle. Of course, we're going to learn that later. Uh, character traits. You're going to find the Greeks speak um, quite a bit about this, to some degree, Immanuel Kant, but this is really the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, the moral theory of Plato and Aristotle. And then motives, um, kind of a deontological, Immanuel Kant, uh, application here. And then the concluding part of the uh, chapter. The conclusions and you may decide that you would like to test yourself on how much of this uh, you know and 
how your thinking is uh, going. You can do that if you want to go through some of the exercises. That's up to you. I don't uh, require that. But you should have this read very soon, if not now. Um, it should be finished today. Continue to go over what we have on this side of the paper here, the glossary terms. And when we get to the um, to the lab sessions on tomorrow afternoon and Thursday morning, we'll go into a little bit of um, a little bit more of a discussion of some of the salient points that are made here in this part of the chapter, and I'll just kind of um, add my two cents worth uh, to what Poyman says in the chapter. So that's what we'll be going over uh, tomorrow and Thursday. I think it's going to be tomorrow afternoon and Thursday morning at 11. As usual, I will send out the invitation not respecting the group that you're in. So if you're in section 100 and the time is better for you, you can attend uh, the section 101's um, lab or vice versa. So I'll send out both invitations to both uh, labs and you can attend the one that's more con most convenient for you. And like we've been doing recently, I'm going to be trying to record at least one of those sessions so that I can make that available on the YouTube channel. And that's where you should always go. Uh, that's where I'm placing the, um, all of the videos now because we've been having email trouble. Some people have not been getting the email links. Uh, so you should just perennially check my YouTube um, page to, to see what I've uploaded recently. Do that at least once a week. And as I've said, I'm going to start trying to record at least one of those help sessions. And then, as usual, if you need me, you need me to, to, um, to ask me any questions, send me an email, and, um, and we'll schedule a, a Zoom session just between you and me. Um, so if anybody, has, if anybody is out there that cannot make the, um, the sessions, either one of them then and, and you're feeling lost uh, just shoot me an email and we'll we will try to get you a slot so stay tuned for the labs uh, attend them if you can and uh, we'll talk again soon thanks